Well, hello. My name is Terry Virgo, and I've been asked to speak to you about the early days of New Frontiers, how we got started, uh, what were the values that we were maintaining, what had God done with us? Well, it started, I guess, really with the beginning of the so-called charismatic movement. Uh, God began to fill people with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I personally had my own experience of the Spirit, which kind of changed things quite a bit. I had been saved in my mid-teens from a totally non-Christian background and had joined a nearby Baptist church where the preaching was great and was really warm, friendly church, big church really, six, six, seven hundred people. And uh, yeah, it was, preaching was super. Um, when I got filled with the Spirit, the sense of God's nearness uh, was remarkable. Then I had the joy of laying hands on some people and, and when we gathered, there was a kind of intimacy and the sense God is here now in a way that we didn't normally experience on a Sunday in our Baptist church. When that guy preached, you felt God was there, but the preliminaries, the worship was kind of uh, not very significant. He just sang a few hymns and then he preached. But now when we gathered, you felt, hey, God is here now. And it was very exciting. And for myself, I got called to full-time ministry, I went away to London to go to Bible college and went to a church that was a fresh new church where the spirit was very active. And then I became the pastor of a church which became like that gradually. It took a little while, but gradually people were getting filled with the Holy Spirit and it began to be a genuinely charismatic church. The worship was very dynamic, gifts of the spirit were frequent, and people began to gather at the church I was in, a small town uh, called Seaford between Eastbourne and New Haven on the south coast. And gradually people were visiting us because, hey, it was a bit kind of phenomenal. And then I was invited to the home of a guy about three quarters of an hour away and uh, spoke, laid hands on some people. We had a great evening. And then they said, would I come back every week? And I said, I can't do that. I'm a pastor. And they said, well, if we meet every week, would, would you come every other week? And I thought, yeah, no, I will do that. And it was good. I took a car full every time. It was a good discipling opportunity in the car and in the meeting. And uh, gradually that, that grew, grew. It grew so much that uh, in the end, I'd stood in the, the door frame, uh, speaking to people in the room and in the hall, literally up the stairs into the kitchen. Uh, in fact, the guy had a whip round that extended his house. It became a it became a living church, to be honest. It started as a midweek Bible study, but it became a, a vibrant church. Uh, and then one couple from there moved to another town, and uh, they said, "Would you come on the other weeks, uh, alternate weeks?" So I said, "Okay, I will do that." So I was going on alternate weeks to two towns, of travelling out to them. Then gradually, in my home church. We began to raise up uh, young men who would preach. So I didn't have to be there every Sunday. And I began to go to more of these so-called house churches, really. So from Hastings in the east through to uh, um, Worthing, all within like an hour's drive uh, of uh, about an arc around the south coast of churches I was going to, probably about eight, I would think. And they all began to grow. And in fact, they, they moved out of the homes because they filled the homes and started hiring school rooms, uh, community centers, wherever they could find a place. And gradually, the guys who hosted them effectively became pastors and they became churches. And to be honest, most of them have grown quite substantially uh, so that uh, the church that uh, I first started, got involved with in a home is now meeting in a like a 500 seater uh, former uh, warehouse now it's a, a very big church uh, similarly uh, one in Hastings which started with 14 people in a basement flat is now meeting in a former indoor uh, cricket uh, place so I mean it's huge uh, one in Eastbourne we started with 24 people it grew to nearly a thousand uh, then all around Sussex to be honest, most of the churches, Chichester and other places that started small now meet in what used to be a warehouse, now it's a church. 
And so that, that was how we got started. Once a month, I would hire, first of all, a hotel and then ultimately uh, the town hall uh, on once a month on a Monday night and people started gathering. And we started with, I don't know, about 250, but it grew until the town hall could seat 1,300. We'd gather about 1,000 once a month. So it was a growing uh, thing. And what we felt more and more was the Holy Spirit was being poured out like new wine and it needed a new wineskin. There were at that time almost like two uh, streams. People, more and more people were getting filled with the Holy Spirit in the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. And some said, well, look, you know, don't mess with the church. We'll, uh, we'll stu still do church like we always have. But if you must be uh, charismatic, go to your charismatic conferences. You've got your private prayer language, you know, that. Keep it to yourself. Don't don't touch church life. But to be honest, we felt quite strongly that the new wine needed a new wineskin because the, the phenomenon of the presence of the Spirit, it, you couldn't look kind of contain it. It needed to be, man, it was the manifestation of the Spirit, the Bible says. The Spirit wants to be manifest. He wants to have freedom. And so we needed to start churches where we could be free to follow God where the presence of the Spirit could be acknowledged and, and there could be freedom to follow him. And so we were beginning new churches. And that's how we started. I personally moved uh, from Seaford uh, to Brighton. And there we started with about 35 people. Uh, and, and that now is a multi-site, 1,400 people in that church now. And that's grown and grown. Got a big warehouse in the centre of Brighton and so on. That, that has been something of the story. And when we first got going, we, other people were beginning to do similar things in different parts of the UK. So for us, we were predominantly in the South. We started in Sussex. We began to get involved in Kent, Hampshire, uh, into South London. And, and effectively, they were nearly all house churches when we started. And so we had to kind of think, what do we do with this? How do we, how do we go forward? Uh, and, and while this was happening, one of the guys who was with us had a vision and a prophecy. And in the vision, he saw a herd of elephants and they were kind of charging. And then they came to uh, some undergrowth and they kept going. Uh, and they made a way through. And the opening line of his prophecy was, there are no well-worn paths before you but together you can make a path where there is no path and you can accomplish more together than you could apart and so for the first time we began to see God was inviting us to be if you like like a movement initially I was I wasn't looking for that it was just Terry Virgo is helping us in our home and now we're helping this home we're helping this home and I would gather the pastors to pray together and we used to pray every Thursday morning and that number started in my home just with three of us and gradually it grew till we couldn't get in the home we we moved out of the home and gradually guys were coming in from Sussex and from Kent even from South London every Thursday morning they'd all pile in and so we were praying together and feeling a real sense of comradeship a real brotherly love in the presence of God in prayer and this prophecy made us sit up really that you can accomplish more together. And we felt, wow, we're meant to become something together. And I thought, well, what, what will that mean? Uh, and we talked around it after this prophecy came. When the prophecy came, it was like, wow, that sounds pretty important. And we talked with one another. And I went away and came back after a week or two and said, look, here, I think if we're going to be uh, like, a group of churches working together, we need to know why and who and what. And uh, we said, well, we don't need to rewrite the creed. Uh, you know, we're evangelical Christians. We all, we're, we're basically evangelicals. We don't need to restate that. But what would be our priorities? And so we said, well, the first one was that we'll be biblically rooted. Whatever it says in the Bible, we'll do. You see, what we found was when the Spirit was poured out, and for instance, I came from a Baptist background, 
Well, there was no room for the spirit in the meeting. Uh, and then when that when the, the, they began to get more and more people were filled with the spirit, and then you have what's called the the democratic church meeting. And uh, to be honest, this was happening all around in the UK. Will, will we be open to the fresh move of the spirit? Well, in a in a democratic church, uh, for me, a Baptist church, you have a vote, and if the vote says, "Are we open to this?" and and, and you know, twenty percent say, "Yeah, yeah." Eighty yeah. percent are, "No, thank you. We don't want to change anything." So you couldn't do what the Bible says, because the vote said no. So we wanted we wanted to have a church that that didn't have that kind of vote that shut the door on you. And then similarly, friends of mine were in the Church of England. They were getting filled with the Spirit, having a fresh life. I knew a vicar who wanted to change things in his church. He wanted to get rid of some pews, not allowed to. Bishop wouldn't let that happen. And so what you found was the church structure didn't permit people to follow the way the Holy Spirit seemed to be leading. And so that's why we had to get out and start again. It wasn't because we had a, a doctrine of house church, or some people did, because in the Bible they met in homes, and some people had a kind of theology of it. We just, we just met in homes because we could. Now, interestingly enough, when we started meeting in homes, a lot of things happened just kind of because you're in a home. Because when I went to church, in those early days, I mean, I come from a terribly pagan world, you had to learn to wear a suit and a tie, and it was very formal, and you didn't speak to anybody. But when you go in a home, you know, everybody's just relaxed. And when I went to church, there was a kind of back, back row mentality. People would sat at the back. Well, in someone's home, there is no back row. And uh, you're just friends together. And, and you're on first name terms straight away. And so you're just friends, which, which completely changed the atmosphere of going to church. When I went to church, to this Baptist church, the preaching was great, but I didn't know anybody. And you'd shake hands with the pastor at the end, but you didn't get to know anybody. Well, now we were in homes and everybody knew everybody. And you pray for one another and lay hands on people. And hey, we began to be a bit like a family. Uh, and, and God began to teach us to be together and, and we'd worship in a very unstructured way. We didn't have space for a, a musical instrument in the room. We just began to sing and stuff. And so it was very free-flowing, very spontaneous, very alive, very attractive. People it just kept growing. People loved this kind of relational. So church for us wasn't very religious. It was very relational. It was very friendly. And, the, and these began to be values for us. We said, well, if we're going to start being a movement, what, what are our values? Well, the Bible is going, if we're not going to let people vote things out, we'll see what, what does the Bible say? And, and then we're going to be open to the Holy Spirit. That's the sort of church we'll have. And, and we do believe in believers' baptism. Uh, and so we wanted to nail that. And, and we want small groups when the churches began to grow. We want to have small groups as well. And so it was really a list of values associated with how you run church. That's what we did. And we began to grow. And we thought, well, what, what should we call ourselves? Because by then, several of these churches had grown and got their own name, like New Life Church or Community Church or whatever. And so we said, well, we can keep your names, but we'll, we'll say... Uh, we all belong to, we're all associated with New Frontiers. New Frontiers we came up with as a response to this vision of the elephants charging through, breaking through to new territory. And so we are, we're on a new frontier. Uh, that's, how, that's who we are together. And so we all agreed. I came up with about 15 values. They're all on my website. Uh, we've, and even on the website, we've made it conversational. You go through them, and I'm just sitting there talking to a young man, answering questions, rather than... We didn't want to be too formal. We didn't want to meet someone and say, oh, here's our list of values on paper. You think... It, we want to meet, meet people. That, it was a very relational thing. And so the way we explained our values was also relational. So uh, I... Um, you know, the, the, the value would come up on the screen and then this young guy would ask me questions. Why do you say that? What is that about? And so we wanted to keep it very open, very relational, 
and people would come to see it. If they wanted to join, they would join with an understanding of this is who we are. And gradually, I began to get involved, invited to help existing churches to transition. So originally, they were all house churches that outgrew their homes into schools, into community halls, and so on. And then, initially, one church in South London said, would you help us? And I went, and it had its own history, it had its own building, and uh, I went. They asked me to go for a week, two weekends and a week. And I preached all through that week, they had special meetings, I laid hands on some people. We had a terrific week together. And at the end, they said, can we become identified with you? And, and I, I said, yeah, I, I really like them. And I started going there about once a month. And uh, I would have the evening with the leaders, the house group leaders and so on, a full evening with them. And the next day with the pastor and his wife, and the next evening with the whole church. And after a few months, that church radically, radically changed. They even changed the seating in the church building. They turned everything around. They opened it up to the worship. It transformed from a fairly formal evangelical church to a church alive in the spirit. And it, it went so well that other churches in South London observed and said, will you help us? Will you help us? Will you help us? And so we kept on growing. And then some of us were traveling uh, to Harrogate in the north to what was called the Dales Bible Week. And the Dales was uh, a, a week uh, like a bit like the Keswick Convention, which has been running for decades. Uh, but instead of going as individuals, you went as a church and camped in tents and caravans. And we all used to go to the Dales where uh, something grew to like five, six, seven thousand. It was a big, big conference. And we went up in our caravans and so on. And then they said to me, why don't you start one in the South? I'd, I'd become friendly with the people who organized it. They asked me to preach. And uh, uh, so I'd kind of become very close friends. So they said, no, come, you, you, why don't you do one? Because uh, it's a long way to pull your caravan from the South Coast all around, around London and up. So, okay. So we went to a, a nearby uh, racing uh, place, a race course, uh, called Plumpton Racecourse. And uh, we hired a circus tent and we put on our own summer Bible week. And uh, we started, the first year was like 2,700. And we grew over 10 years, really, 10 years, more and more churches being planted, more and more people gathering in. And uh, we, in, in 10 years, it grew to just short of 10,000. So it was an exciting development, more and more people getting involved. And uh, we began to wonder, should we, people asked me, are you on a mission, what are you doing? And, and we began to wonder, because knowing of these other groups, like up in the north of England and in the west and so on, we thought, well, we don't want to tread on other people's toes. Um, maybe we should be involved in France or in, we had some contacts in Holland. People came from Holland every year to the Downs Bible Week. Uh, so we thought maybe we should be involved in, on, in continental Europe. And then one day I was praying with some of the guys and I saw a vision of the southeast of England uh, with the southeast corner of England on the map had a bow superimposed on it with like an arrow being pulled back across the map, pointing out to continental Europe and on. And as the bow, the bow, I... I, I I saw in the picture, in the, in the vision, it was just pulled back as far as London on the map. And I felt God said to me, if you don't go beyond London, if you don't pull the arrow back right across, your arrow is not going to go very far. Just pull it back to London. It won't go. You've got to pull it right back. And so, hey, God had once again spoken to us through prophecy to shape the way we moved. As a result of which, we started planting churches across the UK. And we moved right across, up into Manchester, into Scotland, and, and we planted all the time, more and more. So we started our own training programs. We, we started year out programs. Young guys, maybe just before university or just after, take a year out and, and be on a training program, go help plant a church and so on. And uh, other guys getting a theological training so that we could plant churches with pastors. Uh, so that's the way we just did it. 
And uh, we, we, we closed our South Coast Bible Week, our Plumpton thing, and moved to a place near Coventry called Stoneley. It was a big agricultural college, uh, whereas Plumpton was all mud, especially in the rainy years, unbelievable. Uh, but Stoneley had, it was a proper built program. You could have concrete roads and, uh, and we just grew. We started with the 10,000 that we'd finished at uh, Plumpton and over another 10 years, we grew to a just short of 30,000 people. So Stoneley Bible Week was kind of huge and uh, it was wonderful. People came, their church group came. So we'd have Bible teaching, we have big celebration meetings, we'd have seminars in the afternoons, we'd have football and other games between the churches, and it was a fun place to be. And people enjoyed it very, very much. People came year after year uh, in all kinds of British weather, uh, but it just grew and grew. And, uh, and we, you know, we've gradually gone, uh, planting, starting new churches, uh, establishing what has become uh, quite well known now, the New Frontiers churches across the UK. And uh, there came a moment where people often would say to me, are you going on overseas mission? And uh, a brother in our ranks had been in India for 13 years and he started a church in, in Mumbai, what was called Bombay at the time. And he invited me to go over and speak at a conference, which I did. And then he invited me back a second time and said, would you look at the church that um, you know, I started this church, but I, I'm not secure about it. We come and look at it, and I I looked at it, and uh, they said, you know, would you become? Could this church become part of who you are? And uh, to be honest, the leaders were really out of step with one another, and I think the leaders' wives hated one another. It was really bad. But the church was a great. I don't know. It was very unusual, very bright, happy church. But the leadership. And so I said, look, if the leaders will all resign, I'll get involved. And to my amazement, they all resigned. And we had a, an older pastor with us by that time in the church in Brighton. And, and he went out there for about six months and preached every week for them and raised up a fresh leadership. And that became a church we were working with called Living Word in uh, Bombay. Gradually that grew and uh, then they wanted to plant out and so they planted out a thing called Living Hope and we had a, an evangelist in our ranks called Lex Loisides and I said Lex would you move out there and help them to plant this church to be evangelistic with them he said yeah yeah so he went out there for some months and they planted Living Hope they planted Living Light they planted around Mumbai and uh, and gradually across to uh, Hyderabad to uh, Bangalore, Delhi, Goa, and now I mean I was speaking to the uh, leader out there recently over 200 churches in India now, and uh, dear friends I mean this all has taken like 40 years so I went out to India every year and a lot of these pastors I know them on Christian name terms they're dear dear friends of mine others are coming through. Uh, different languages, India is made up of all sorts of different cultures, states, languages, and we're, you know, in Hindi situations and so on. It's wonderful. Last time I was in Mumbai, I spoke at a conference in, in um, Bombay, 1,500 of our people gathered, and then down to Goa, similar. God, God's doing a wonderful thing. One church is started with. And then we had similar things. Uh, we were in Cape Town. There was a, I was invited, a couple, a family came over, uh, to our Downs Bible Week and I'd just written a book called Restoration in the Church and uh, they said we want to put a conference on in a town called East London in South Africa we'll call it Restoration in the Church and I went down had a good time uh, leaders of all sorts of movements had come together and I got invited back regularly back to South Africa but there was one new church in Cape Town that had been going for about a year and they said to me, we hear you're coming to East London, would you come down to Cape Town afterwards and uh, speak to our church? It'll be our first anniversary. And I went down afterwards, we had a great time together, laid hands on some people, taught them and so on. And, and then I got kept on being invited back to South Africa by these various movement leaders who've been at this conference. 
And every time I went, I finished at the church in Cape Town. And then the guy who was pastoring there said, I, I really want to join you. And he came across the UK, met one of our leaders, he said, would he come and be my assistant? And a guy called Simon Pettit, who came from a Sussex church, went down to Cape Town, the idea being to be his assistant. But he hardly had arrived and this pastor felt God had called him to go to New Zealand. And actually Simon was asked to lead the church in Cape Town, what's now called Jubilee Church. And now it's huge. It's, uh, it's about 1,500 people. There are, there are two sites. We planted churches all over uh, uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia. We got churches all over Southern Africa that all come out initially from one, one church in Cape Town. We've done similar in Mexico, one church in Guadalajara, now lots of churches in Mexico, one church in Moscow, lots of churches now in Russia, Ukraine. Uh, that's happened in several places. And now the arrow pull back thing is sending more and more people. We've gained the resources because we've got multiplied people, we've got multiplied young people who want to go on mission. Uh, we've done our conferences for young people. We still do New Day, which gathers 7,000 teenagers every summer. Uh, of course, the virus has stopped it for a couple of years, but we'll kick in again the year after. And these young people want to go on mission. They're excited about uh, spreading the gospel. And so we, we have sent people out from the UK all over uh, to places in Europe, uh, Amsterdam, uh, Lyon, uh, Lille, uh, Paris, Berlin, uh, um, Madrid, Porto, I mean, on and on it goes. Istanbul, people have gone, gone. They keep on going. And uh, we're on world mission. We're on world mission. And now uh, New Frontiers is in over 80 nations and we're over 2,000 churches. And uh, through this strange uh, method of speaking on Zoom, for instance, uh, we have now, I can, I, I can speak as I did last week, to a team of guys one from Sydney, Australia, one from Dubai, one from Mumbai, one from Cape Town. There's a team. We, in New Frontiers, we used to be just one uh, group, Terry and his team growing and growing all the time. Then a few years back, uh, we, we were provoked by a visiting preacher very helpfully. It's time to move on, time to, uh, uh, for someone to replace Terry to be the leader and we felt God had spoken to us. And we looked to see who would that young man be who would be the leader to take over this whole thing. And God spoke to us very clearly, and which I don't have time to uh, give you the detail, but God spoke very clearly about not just one guy to replace me, but rather like a family. I, I have the joy of having five children, uh, all of whom have their children now. So we have 21 grandchildren, believe it or not. And uh, each of my, my sons, my daughter, they've got their own family. And within New Frontiers by this time, we had guys who had, uh, they would have said on my behalf, were overseeing churches, for instance, in India or elsewhere, even across the UK, where we have over 300 churches in the UK. There were guys who were overseeing churches. Initially, they would have said on my behalf. But there came this time where, hey, Terry needs to stand back, Terry needs to let go, give it to the next generation. And there were something like 15 guys around the world who took on this global thing. And it's grown rapidly more and more even since that's happened. And so we now have a number of various groups all come under the umbrella of New Frontiers, but with their various titles and names, carrying the same values on the same mission, and once a year, we all come together. So in October, we'll come together as team leaders in Cyprus is where we've been the last few years and, and fellowship together, retain our unity, share our values, our, our news, our updates, and then go back and get on and raise up and keep going. God's given us a calling. One of the things that was prophesied over us quite early on was you will change the expression of Christianity around the world. It's a wonderful commission from God. And so we're going, trying to build a church that honors the Bible, that welcomes the Spirit, 
that enjoys the grace of God. So we're not legalistic, but we're training up people to go on mission. So we're on a mission together. It's great to meet you. I do hope that this rush through some of about 40 or 50 years of history has been interesting to you. There's a book called No Well-Worn Paths, which uh, I wrote some years ago. If you'd like a copy, I could send you one. That'll tell our story in much more detail. And then in May, uh, another book coming out called God's Special Treasure, which again will tell you a lot of our values. That will be coming out from IVP in May. God bless you. Be good to meet you. Bye-bye for now.